You are now rocking with the Inner Circle Podcast, the premier podcast for Xbox One. And I'm your host, KORS Kalel, with B Money 101. Yo, what's up, people, man? We back in the building. <laughs> Nasher Smasher on deck, man. Gears is back, so we ready. Get out there on the field, man. Victor Hoffman, y'all get it. Word. And our new alternating team member, Anchorman V. Hey, guys. Glad to be back on the podcast in over a year. Yeah. Since time has flown. Time has flown. Um, today we're going to focus on Microsoft First Party Studios, Mafia 3, and the truth about Konami reviews. Um, so obviously today, you know, with Microsoft coming out with Gears of War Ultimate Edition, you know, it's been getting a lot of good reviews and you've had some stale ones. But for the most part, on, on Metacritic overall, it, it has received a, I guess you could say, a fairly good score. Considering all the upgrades that they've done to the game, the coalition has done a solid job, you know, just getting a feel for the game. You're pretty much prepping themselves um, while they're building Gears of War 4 next year, 2016. Um, you look at games that's coming out this year, like Halo 5. Uh, you look at Forza. You look at what Lionhead is doing with the Fable series. And you kind of understand the gripe that most people have um, when it comes to the other platform holders fan bases a lot of times people always reflect on microsoft is always pumping out the same games every year and though as gamers and as, and, and as xbox gamers we love those games those games are always high triple a quality and for the most part the games sell in the millions they're million dollar sellers so i can understand how microsoft does it but sometimes i have to question why doesn't microsoft let some of their big time studios do something besides the same franchises over and over and over again. And the reason why I brought this up was because I look at Naughty Dog and I look at the history of what they've done and where they are. You know, you look back and you look at games like, you know, Jack and Daxter, you know, then you look at what they did with Uncharted, you know, then you look at where they are now with The Last of Us, you know, they're a franchise, excuse me, they're a publisher that, you know, has always been I guess you could say synonymous with greatness. And that's because a lot of their work shows that. And obviously you have new studios coming out. You have what used to be Black Tusk now was the coalition. And Bungie is no longer a part of the Microsoft's first party studios, but we have 343 now who has came out with games like, you know, Reach. They've had Halo 4. They're now currently working on Halo 5. And they did dibble dabble a little bit. Um, as part of a group of developers for the Master Chief Collection. Um, then you look at Lionhead Studios, who has been synonymous with the Fable franchise, and of course, Turn 10, that is synonymous with the Forza franchise. Now, the one thing I can say about Microsoft is that they did allow the Turn 10 Studios to do something else besides Forza by handing over um, the Forza Horizon series to uh, Playground, which to me by far has been an excellent idea. And Forza Horizon 2 by far was probably one of the best racing games I've ever played. Um, then you look at what Fable is doing with their Fable Legends title, which is free to play. But I did hear a rumor that they're working on a new IP. So my question now is, why isn't 343 doing something else besides Halo? Like, will they be able to do something else besides Halo after halo 5 um and will the coalition ever return to that game that we saw when they were black tusk because my worry is that after we get gears of war 4 <laughs> the next thing is some type of gears of war spinoff i'm afraid of that and the same thing with 343 after they release gears of, i'm mean, excuse me after they release halo 5 Will they turn around and either start working on Halo 4 or a spinoff of Halo? You know, and I know 343 is really built just to make Halo because they have like the holy grail of Halo. But it would be great just to see this talented studio do something else besides Halo. So what are your thoughts on this, um, Brandon? Because I, I, I'm just really concerned about the wear out of these franchises over the next decade because it's a brand new generation. Do you think that they should continue to do what they're doing or maybe they should actually branch off and do something else? Um, you know, I've, I've spoken about this um, a couple of times before 
And this was definitely one of my worries um, once, you know, Black Tusk changed into the coalition. Um, you know, it was a good day and a sad day at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, because with that name, it just, you know, threw the, drew the line in the sand to let us know that the coalition will make Gears of War for the rest of its existence. <laughs> right. Uh, <laughs> you know, you know, I'm a big fan of Gears. You know, that was that was part of my intro. I'm, I'm loving the Gears uh, Ultimate Edition. But, you know, you you have these big, you know, publishers and, and game companies who have this, you know, just an enormous amount of talent. And to, to see it only be put into one franchise is, is kind of a disappointment. Like you mentioned with, uh, with Naughty Dog, you know, you, you see what they can do across, you know, multiple genres of games. Um, and, and like you said, they've been all synonymous with greatness. Um, and you definitely want to see that with 343 and with the Coalition. Um, you know, the Samaritan demo was something that was mm. uh, looked like it could be something special. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people were hyped for that. They wanted to see where that was going. And then out of nowhere, you know, Microsoft signs on to get the Gears of War franchise. And, and now we, we're going to be pretty much stuck with Gears, I think. Um, I would definitely love to see them, you know, do something else besides those two main franchises. Um, I think uh, what you do over time is, is oversaturate the market. Um, if you look at the Master Chief Collection um, that released last year, um, this year we're getting Halo 5, and then next year we get Halo Wars 2. So right. um, th these next three years, it's it's Halo in your face every year. Right. Um, and, of course, they all have reasons for being released. Um, you know, the Master Chief Collection puts every all the previous Halo games together. Halo 5 is, a, is the next step, and then Halo Wars is an RTS game. But when you look at it, you know, from the outside, um, you know, as an outside gamer, it just looks like Halo, Halo, Halo. Right. You know what I mean? And it's it doesn't feel like there's many more games on the roster when, when it truly is. So um, I would love to see them go in a different direction, um, especially after this uh, Gears 4 releases. I would love to see what Coalition can do. Uh, bring that Samaritan demo back. Let's, let's see what that... Uh, can do. I mean, we we know that you know Microsoft is definitely committed to bringing us new franchises and new games. Um, so let let your big companies do what they do. Um, they they've got the talent. So let's yeah. see what they can do. Right. I mean, I think that the thing is, is like you want these these developers to create. You don't want them to be told to do something. I think that's what wore Bungie out, and probably one of the reasons why they stepped down. Um, but I think with Phil Spencer in charge he may be a little bit more lenient than maybe a Don Matrick was, who probably just saw money. <laughs> you look at yeah, Halo. It was all a dollar sign. Yeah, it was all a dollar sign. You know, you see Halo just selling $5 million, $8 million, $9 million, you know, $13 million, And it's like, uh, why would I stop making Halos, you know? But at the same time, I just feel like, like you said, if you're getting a Halo every year, on the outside, from the outside, not as an Xbox game, because we understand this, but as, as a... a, a you know, a, a, a gamer for a different platform, you're saying, hey, say to, you, to, to yourself, they just keep pumping Halos out every year. I don't want to be with a console that pumps Halos out every year because it's going to get boring. Even if the games are different, you don't really care because you're only looking at the name. Brandon, I mean, excuse me, Anchor, what is your thoughts? It's a bit harder uh, for me in particular because even before I was on YouTube, I was paying attention to this new uh vancouver studio that microsoft was putting together and they were hiring people from kind of all over they were hiring people from like need for speed franchise a couple people from uh uh splinter cell they were just picking it picking and choosing different people and i was wondering myself what kind of game are these people making it's having elements of a stealth shooter having elements of a racing game right. and just all this different kind of stuff and i was like what kind of game could these people be possibly be making and i was like Black Tusk, this is this was something very interesting to me, especially when they showed this at E3 2013, where they showed off what was called Shang Heist, yep. or whatever the, that project was they were working on. It looked interesting to me. It looked like something that could be a more modern, focused, adventure, stealth kind of game, which is something that Microsoft really hasn't done so much of in terms of their own franchises. It's always either been... Uh, first person shooter third person action shooter or a racing game this was kind of like 
it's not I wouldn't say it's like Uncharted, but it was something that wasn't necessarily just a shooter. Right. And it was really disappointing to me whenever they got saddled with gears because I felt like their creativity was being stifled. That if if Microsoft had created the studio out of nothing to make Gears of War in particular, and they said strictly this is for Gears of War from the get-go, it didn't show any other projects, I would have been like, okay, I get that. Looks good to me. That would have been great. But it, it was specifically that studio, I felt really disappointed in. Now, 343, they were built for Halo. We knew what they were They they knew what they were getting right. into. It would be nice if they were able to do, to like, to dabble in a couple franchises every once in a while. Like, you're working on Halo, but... A sub team can do this other game, which would be really fun for other people to enjoy. And so it's it's a lost opportunity is the way I see it. Uh, I would like to see them be able to do other titles if they become a large enough studio. It's not a absolutely huge studio yet, but it could be if they do very well with these franchises. Yeah, I mean, I, I like the coalition. I think after talking to Rod and seeing what they showed off at E3, I was impressed with it. A lot of people weren't, but I like the atmosphere. Um, I like the direction. You know, one of my one of my thoughts and one of my theories is that that monster that was chasing them could be a creature before the locusts even got them. <laughs> because, you know, the locusts, when you look at their monsters, they're always like, you know, tied to some inorganic material, some type of metal. They're all bent and twisted and deformed. But this monster looked like it was whole. Like the locusts aren't as, you know, it's not as many as them in the world anymore. So you have regular monsters roaming the planet now. So that could be a theory in that. Um, and it would be great to see if that was to come true, if that was something that they were looking forward to. But at the same time, it's like, once that franchise, or shall I say, once that game is done, and it's out, and we're all playing it, and we're loving it, what do they do next? You can't, don't give me Gears of War, the RTS. You know, don't give me Gears of War Wars. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Don't give me that. Don't give me, you know... Gears of War, the Cog Wars. Right, don't right. Don't give me a prequel. Don't give me the Pendulum Wars. Don't, don't, don't give me those games. Give me something else. Give me what you initially wanted to do. Do something else besides Gears, and I will be impressed. I want 343 to do something else. I was really impressed with Halo 4 when you had your first space battle. And you're flying around, and you're shooting down Banshees. And I was really impressed with that. And I said, man, this would be really cool if 343 came out with a space dogfighting game. It, you know what I'm saying? It doesn't have to be in the Halo universe, but it could have been something based on what they did in the Halo universe. And I, I found that really interesting um, and thought to myself, wow, they could really do something in the sci-fi genre with space battles. Um, but it just seems like they're just destined to pump out Halo games. And I feel like that talent not that it's wasted on Halo, because Halo is going to be phenomenal. The things that they do with Halo are great. Graphically, the games look good. The sound effects are amazing. You have, like, literally the original people who have worked on Halo still working at 343. You have the Halo Bible. And you have great art artists and art direction within the game. The game is going to be great when it comes out. But at the same time, I just don't want them to waste their time on just constantly pumping out Halos, and I just don't want them to oversaturate the market. Um, and I'm hoping that when we get a chance to talk to Phil this year, he can give us an idea of what they'll be doing besides um, Halo, or if it's just going to be Halo year after year, which I think to a lot of us fans may be disappointing. Some people may like it, but in my opinion, I just feel like getting a Halo every year is not a good thing. Not at all. Um... So, obviously, we got a chance to see Mafia 3 at Gamescom, and they had a big, big twist on the game that really surprised me, my, my damn self. <laughs> and that this this game is actually focusing on the Black Mafia. Now, it seems that this has become controversial. And, you know, it's, it's terrible to see that you have to have the racial stigma raise his head again in the video game industry when it comes to people of ethnicity um and in the video game industry and you know obviously let's just be honest here let's just be realistic most of the time when a developer makes a game they base it on um their own i guess you could say their own personal lives and the things that's around them and the things that they think of so the last thing that let's say a 
European developer who has, you know, a Caucasian design or a German developer or a Japanese developer is going to think about is an African-American or a Latino protagonist. Um, but the fact that Mafia 3, which usually centers around the Italian mob, is focusing on an African-American protagonist has rubbed some people the wrong way. So, Brandon, I'm going to let you go ahead and ride with that and give us your thoughts on what you think the problems is with the game um, and what people really should be focusing on. Before I start, I, I definitely have to shout out Take Two um, for actually taking this risk. Um, they're they're one of the only companies who have have been able to put a black character uh, um, as one of the main focuses and run with that. Um, Take Two is the parent company of 2K mm -hmm. and Rockstar. Right. And we know we know Rockstar Games. We we know San Andreas was a huge hit right. when that released. Um, CJ was the main character of that. Um, and then you know with the uh, Grand Theft Auto Five, you know Franklin. Uh, who is a, a black character, was one of the main characters of the three characters. Um, so I, I definitely have to applaud them for that, mm -hmm. um, taking a big risk, putting a, a, a mixed character um, in Mafia 3 and, mm -hmm. and kind of taking that focus away from uh, the Italian mob. Mm -hmm. So I definitely have to applaud them for that. Um, but in, in regards to uh, the gamer reaction and, and the, some of the backlash that Mafia 3 has already received without the game even being released, um, I think it's a bit disturbing. Um, you know, as, as gamers, I, I always felt like, you know, when you play a game, you play a game to enjoy it. Um, I, I never really made race a, a big thing uh, when playing a video game. Um, you know, m most of the characters, as we know, are usually white uh, protagonists. Um, so it, it's never really been a big deal um, to me. And I think it's um, a, a bit odd that when a black character is the main protagonist that there's there's always some type of backlash um i, I don't really know the, the reasoning behind it but i um, just looking at you know some of the comments and stuff that the mafia 3 was receiving it's like i you know people are saying that they don't want to play as a black character you know they don't want to live through a black life and things like that um and i think it's totally unnecessary uh, you, you play the game to enjoy it um to see what the story is about and you know to to see what the end point is so um I, I i i don't really understand what the backlash is um because you can either have a, a white protagonist or you can have a protagonist where you can make the character be whoever you want them to be right. but as soon as there's a character of of color or anything like that there's always a backlash and i, and I can't figure out why with mafia 3 I had not played any of the other Mafia games, but I had played a couple of uh, Mafia-esque games. Mostly, like, the Godfather games. I've played those. And it seems when it comes to a lot of games that focus around crime, it's either one of two things. You're either in New York or you're in L.A. Right. If you're in New York, there's always some Italian Mafia element. Right. And they've always, they always bring it up. There's some turf war or something like that. Or you're in L.A. where people are jacking your cars and just it's like GTA-esque uh, situation. <laughs> right, right. Um, it's, so it's always one of those two things. That, like very rarely do you see anybody actually try to deviate from that. Uh, like you got Hotline Miami, which is not necessarily the same kind of game. But this is a game that's set in Louisiana. Which I know I, <laughs> I did an entire uh, term paper on... Uh, the Italian Mafia. So, I mean, it's not like I'm, I'm completely ignoring the entire subject. Right. But to finally see them address the the American Black Mafia is something I am definitely looking forward to, and it opens up a lot of possibilities for stories. Right. Like, for, for so long, we have all these characters who are white, very short hair, athletic, uh, normally have some grizzled past and a low... <laughs> uh, heavy smoker voice, <laughs> right. and it's always it's always something like that. It's the same kind of story every single time. They're just placed in different situations, and so it's finally a nice time to see them branching out into different stories. 
And I know we've talked about this on the multiverse podcast before. Right, is that when they right. when they change the race of characters or something, or have a new character, we don't want it to be a situation where they're they're a minority or they have some sort of quirk or something for the sake of having that quirk. They want it to be because you actually have a story to tell. Right. And as long as that that situation and it has a unique perspective, I'm fine with it. Right. And for people to have a larger problem with it, I know there's the there's the mafia fans who are a little disappointed because it's not mafia anymore. Well, at least not the Italian mafia. Right, it's not the Italian. And so mafia. there's there's a little bit of that, but that happens whenever you have a long running series. Things change. The the old guard like their version of the game and the new people can jump in on uh the the newest version of it. Mm -hmm. And it there's pros and cons to that. But then there are people who legitimately have a problem with having a black protagonist. Right. And to those people, I got to say, tough noogies. I mean, <laughs> there's nothing you can really do about it. Yeah. It's, they, they have a story to tell and just give them a shot. Right. I wonder if people would just be upset if it was something like, you know, the triads. You know, you understand what I'm saying? Like if it was mm -hmm. the Yakuza and it was just mafia, but you was dealing with the Japanese you know japanese model the chinese mob uh, you know little things like that or if it was like a cartel you know at the end of the day i think these games can be done under the mafia name because each one is considered a mafia in its own right you just may have a different mm -hmm. it's just a different family a different ethnic group um and there were black mobs back in the day there were a lot of black mobs back in the day some of america's biggest gangsters were a part of black mobs, you know, in New York and in the South and things like that. So, you know, it's an interesting take on what they're doing with this game. I look forward to playing a game. I'm excited to play the game. Um, obviously, you're going to have a, some people that's going to have backlash. And I'll just, let's just be honest. Racism isn't dead. It's not like it's disappeared because it's the year 2015. It clearly exists today. It's clearly more evident than ever. And a lot of things that's happening um, in the world. Um, but obviously, at the same time, we try not to let that come into, you know, our gaming lives. You know, when I get online, every single one of my friends is definitely different, different race, different color, different, you know, ethnic background. And I'm sure different religions and different political beliefs. I don't ask them for none of that. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I don't want to know, you know, because a lot of times you, you ask somebody or you talk about something and that one little difference could be the thing that could ruin a whole relationship. But my whole thing is, is that if, you know, if everybody's playing games, if we're all gamers and we all love the same games and we're enjoying it. Who cares about who that person is? You know, as long as we're playing games and games is what's keeping us together as a group, that's what's most important. And I think gaming is one of the few, the few, I guess you could say entertainment cultures where race doesn't play a part too much. Um, unless obviously this is in a video game, something like that. So what I'm hoping that comes out of this is that mafia three is well received. The reviews are well received and people will bypass what they see on the cover for a good quality story and good quality action. It's a next gen experience. Definitely for one It's coming from one of the best developers out there and one of the best publishers out there and, and take two. So I'm really looking forward to what they have and hopefully fans will bypass the color of the character skin and just actually play the game and see what the actual story is about and why they went in this direction. If the game is terrible, the game should be terrible because it's a bad game, not because the character is half black. Now, there's some big news all of a sudden. Um, you know, Metal Gear Solid has come out and this game has gotten tens and tens and nines and tens and um you know i if you haven't heard anchorman has had a show recently where he spoke about um why he believed no game deserves a 10 and to a certain extent i kind of agree with him um you know i'm an rpg guy so in my opinion there's some rpgs that deserve tens but at the same time yes i agree there's no game that's absolutely perfect um, because games are games. Games are going to have bugs. Games are going to have glitches. Um, and there may be something that doesn't add up story-wise, or it may be something that isn't right technically within the game. Um, 
But at the same time, I understand why people give games 10s because they almost feel like the game is almost perfect. Um, so they give it a perfect score. And there's nothing wrong with that. I think Metal Gear is a great, great franchise. Um, I love the original. I love Part 2. Um, I played uh, 3, which was really good as well. Um, and then, obviously, I played 4 on the PS3, which was a great game. Um, in each instance, the story has always been good. But they started to add the Metal Gear Online dynamic, um, which is okay, which was solid. Um, and, and they're supposed to be releasing the Metal Gear Online later on. But they didn't include that in any of the reviews, mostly. They just talked about the first, you know, the, the actual story, the main story, the single-player story of the game, which is what Metal Gear usually is focused around. And because of that, it has gotten an extremely, extremely high scores. Now, the thing that people don't know is how these reviews were taken and in the condition these reviews were taken. This just came to light today, and I'm going to hand off to Anchorman and let him let you guys know exactly what happened with Metal Gear's reviews. All right, so what happened with these reviews is just to give you guys some an idea. This game got a lot of 10 out of 10s or some equivalent of that. And notably, it came from GameSpot. Now, GameSpot's given like three other 10 out of 10s this year, so they're very lenient with it. But IGN also gave it a 10 out of 10, which is a bit odd because IGN rarely does that. Now, what nobody did talk about is that nobody talked about how they review these games because most of the time people assume and this is just how most of the reviews work you get a review copy for the game you agree not to talk about it until a certain date which is called an embargo and when the date drops you drop your article you're ready to go now what happened in this situation is that we have games radar and rock paper shotgun to thank for this uh in games radar's uh review which is in progress for them because they will not give a score until later uh, this has been up for two days. What we found out from this so far is what the conditions were for their review. I'm going to read part of the article. You guys can just find it on their website. The article states, For fear of spoilers, Konami invited journalists to review the game at five-day quote-unquote boot camps tied to strict NDAs or non-disclosure agreements. We played between 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. with no unsupervised play outside of these hours. That's a maximum play time of 40 hours, assuming no stoppages for eating, drinking, stretching, or reality. So you're trying to complete a 35 to 50 hour game, or longer depending on your play style, that you've been anticipating for five years in a realistic window of 30 to 35 hours. On one hand, you're finally immersed in one of the deepest, most experimental open worlds in history, overwhelmed by side missions, upgrades, and secrets. On the other, haunted by a TikTok race to reach the end without knowing when that end will come. Extended access under duress is better than none, but twinned by, with our NDA makes this a review of what I can't and won't say. Hmm. Based on the UK boot camp, I know of only one reviewer who was able to play for six days who has seen enough of the game to deliver a meaningful perspective, and I can't even explain why for fear of spoilers. In my boot camp, reviewers were charging through missions wearing a chicken hat, which makes you invisible to the enemy, almost completely ignoring Mother Base, which is uh, the multiplayer aspect of the game, and all the side ops in a race for the end. They say, will it score high? I mean, duh, but I don't feel the boot camp has sufficient ba sufficient basis to offer my views on Kojima's intentions and Metal Gear Solid 5's abiding legacy. At times, the boot camp felt like being gifted a bottle of Macallan 1946 whiskey in a frat house <laughs> and being told to chug, chug, chug. Wow. It's crazy. It's absolutely insane. And so what we can gather from from this particular one, a rock paper shotgun backed it up, and there's a post on NeoGAF. It's going on uh, other forum sites. Is that these reviewers were compromised? Every reviewer was subjected to this sort of situation. They had to travel to this location. They had to do this, and they were supervised the entire time. Wow. They were forced to ignore parts of the game which they did not review, and gave a score anyway. 
They didn't play the full game. They had a cheat to walk through the game faster. And some people gave it a 10 out of 10, which is rare, but leads one to believe that something is off. Mm. And that's ultimately my problem with the situation is that whenever I saw these reviews, my radar was going off saying, what's going on? Right. This doesn't make any sense. Right. And now this comes out, and it's a bit disappointing to see that Konami has just a terrible business practice model. I hope that really changes, though. You know, Konami has, has been taking L's a lot lately. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> They've been taking L's. They've been taking L's with Xbox fans for the Pez uh, thing. Uh, they're taking L's with Ground Zero. You know, they've taken L's with Kojima. Now they're taking L's with um, Games Radar and Rock, Paper, Scissors. It's just funny because um, you, you look at this publisher. I think that obviously Konami is some type of financial trouble. They clearly are. They're in some type of financial trouble. Um, and when you look at it from that perspective, think about them going mobile and getting away from what they used to do. Um, in an aspect, not that they won't make triple A games or double A games for consoles again, but they're going in a mobile direction slightly. Um, they can't risk five years of a game like Metal Gear getting any type of terrible review. They need every single dime from Metal Gear, they need Metal Gear to sell like crack. And <laughs> the crazy thing about it is that Metal Gear was going to sell regardless. I think regardless of it was bad and I was the last game. And I think that, you know, the sentimentality of Kojima leaving and it being the last game played a role in that as well. I think it's like if you were going to give the game a nine because it was Kojima's last game and, you know, it's your last Metal Gear that you may ever play. Hey, I'm going to give this game a 10 because it felt that good. And that's a possibility as well. Um, I think the game may be a nine or a 10. I haven't played it yet. I don't know. I won't know until I play it. Um, but just to hear under the conditions that, some of these uh reviewers were reviewing the game at is a red flag that's a huge red flag for any review that that kind of goes up to a certain extent brandon what are your thoughts on this i think this is a bit ridiculous um, <laughs> it, if we've been following the konami track record the past six months or so they've been treating their employees horrible um you know they've been treating gamers horrible and now they're treating you know, writers horrible. Um, this this is a bit ridiculous. I think uh, Konami needs to go ahead and just hang up their jersey and retire, <laughs> and uh, and let somebody else make make big games because what they're doing right now is is a bit silly. Um, we know Kojima probably had a ridiculous budget for Metal Gear, Word. and uh, you know Konami needs to to get that money back. So uh, whatever it took to to put the best review number out there is what they were trying to do. Um, they, they need many people in the world to go out and support this Metal Gear game because they don't got nothing else. You know, they, they got Pez, and, you know, I'm a fan of Pez, but, you know, FIFA has definitely taken over that market. So Metal Gear is their last hurrah, and if it don't do numbers, you know, they'd be in real trouble. So I, I don't uh, agree with the conditions, you know, that these people had to review the game under, and I don't like the fact that they were able to walk around the game and, just breeze through levels because to me that doesn't tell me that you actually played the game you know what i mean so how can you give a, a review score if if you didn't actually experience the game at its full potential um they didn't play the online um so that's another knock in a review you can't give a game a 10 if you haven't played the full potential of the game so um you know we know the game is going to be good it's it's kojima's last hurrah with konami so you know we got to go out and try to support it but if the game isn't good these reviewers shouldn't have gave it a number right so right anchor yeah i mean i i've already said pretty much everything i had to say i mean it's you're compromised whether you like it or not i mean you going there puts you under the influence of somebody else you playing it's it's like eating your mother-in-law's cooking in front of her and whether it's good or bad, you got to smile. You got to smile. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it's just one of those situations, and it's like, it, for the sake of them being there in that situation, I mean, the game could be the best game ever made, but 
because of this condition, I can't trust it. Right. I can't trust the reviewers for this. And I mean, if somebody did something like this for any other company, if Microsoft did this, if Bethesda did this, if Activision did this, people would be jumping out in the streets. But I don't know what it is. I don't know. This thing is going to get some traction, though. I'm really hoping that it does. Uh, just because I know a lot of people <laughs> uh, love Kojima, but absolutely despise Konami. Yeah, and <laughs> I think crazy. it's gonna translate somehow in the sales at some point. This is crazy. This is very crazy. Um, I, is this obviously a bias? I think gamers, gamers want the game to be great. You know, Metal Gear has a fan base that no matter if the story makes no sense, which most of the time it does. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It. If it makes no sense whatsoever, they're still going to buy it because it's made by Kojima and it's a Metal Gear game. And I love Metal Gear, you know. But when you look at the way the game is designed, it went from the future to the past to the future to the past. And it's just weird how they're intertwining all these things. And you can really get confused. It's one thing to do a prequel. It's another thing to continue that prequel story, you know, especially on a alternating basis. So... Um, you know, I, I, I love the Metal Gears. I love Metal Gear's world. You know, I love the franchise. Uh, ever since I played the first one, which by far to me is a classic. That double disc box on that PlayStation 1. You know, you know what I'm saying? You hit that little alert hit. You open that game up, you get that book, you pull that book out, you see that disc right there, you pop it in, it comes on like a movie. I just remember walking past game stops just amazed that they made this game with an introduction like a movie him being shot out of a submarine coming out the water taking off the wetsuit on the elevator walking in the stone oh my god it was amazing that intro was amazing and i don't know what it is about what's happened over the last couple of years i think it's become a little bit more action-based obviously with you know the 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 ninjas and I know they had, you know, Gray Fox in the first one and you know you have right you know right in the in the others. But you know, it's become so action based and even though it's still slightly it's still a stealth game. Don't get me wrong, I'm not gonna say slightly, it's still a stealth game. But it was just something about that first game that really was just made it a classic. And um, you know, I'm looking forward to playing the new one. and and, and I, I don't know if I'll get into the online. But I'm looking forward to playing a new one. I really hope it's a successful game. I really hope it lives up to its review scores. Um, whether people were biased, whether people just graded it and didn't care about the online, it is hypocritical to, you know, review something based on a story, but then you, you, you turn around and you can't review Gears of War great because the servers weren't turned on. You, you know what I'm saying? Like, you're going you're gonna to review the game based on something, but give it a score because you couldn't play multiplayer. You know, and and I think that who did that? I think that was um, was it GameSpot? Uh, IGN was it IGN? I, IGN, IGN said that they didn't give a score because they were waiting for the service to turn on, to be turned on, which made sense to me. That was like, all right, yeah, yeah. You're, you're waiting to make sure the game's on the point. Right. But then IGN didn't review at all any of the multiplayer, but then gave it a score. Right. Right. And, and that's what I'm saying. It's a little hypocritical to turn around and not review a game because the servers weren't on, and then give it a score. Um, and, I, and, and if that's the case, I hope they review the game again and give it another score um, with the online being on. But then they turn around and review Metal Gear and not play the online because I guess the online is separate. It's his own entity, which is bull because you couldn't play the online without the game, without the disc. So, you know, I don't know, man. People have biases. It is what it is. You have favorite franchises, the franchises you grow up with. I don't know why. I, I can't stress enough to people. When you grow up with something... And it's a part of your gaming history. You have a certain love for that game. And no matter how bad that game is, you're going to show it a slight bias. It doesn't matter if you're a journalist or not. You're going to show it a slight bias. And that's what people do in journalism. And that's why it's so hard for us gamers to believe the journalist. And why we step up as the new journalist because we can give honest opinions about certain things. So real interesting what they've done. Um, with Metal Gear, what Konami has done in their controversial ways of forcing these reviewers to review the game, 
Um, I only wish nothing but success for the game itself, and I look forward to Kojima's next project on his own. Um, and I really, really hope it all works out. So before we get out of here, I just want to touch on some some crazy news from the team over at Remedy. I'm really impressed with uh, what they've been doing with the game. Obviously, Scalebound is my most anticipated, but I am really super excited for Quantum Break. Um, you know, there was some controversy uh, where they were at the SIGGRAPH Awards um, and they were showing off the lighting and, and things like that for Quantum Break. And they were doing things that actually is better than what normally happens. But for some apparent reason, someone thought that when they said that the lighting in the game was being rendered at 720p, they thought the game's resolution was 720p. And the thing is, is that the lighting being rendered at 720p is actually higher than what lighting is usually rendered at. So it's actually an improvement over what lighting in any game is usually rendered at. And the act, the actual game for Xbox One is a 1080p game. Now, usually, I don't like to talk about resolution. I really don't. It's just not my MO. Um, but it's just funny because people like to pounce on things before they actually know what they're talking about just to try to put a negative spin on the Xbox One platform and on, this, on the Xbox One exclusives. So, you know, before we get out of here, I just want to get your thoughts on this. Um... Are you guys impressed with what Remedy has done with Quantum Break so far from what you've seen and what you've heard and now to find out that the game is actually running at 1080p and according to what we read today is actually going to be 30 frames per second, 1080p 30 frames per second looking as good as it does with all of its physics and you know all of the effects that's happening in the game plus it's supposed to be a 20 minute um, I believe a 20 minute television show in between certain sequences in the game are you guys impressed with what's been happening let's start with you anchor in terms of graphics i mean yeah it looks okay but i mean the the resolution thing the only re resolutions i care about is as long as it's not for 480p <laughs> I, mean, I, I, I still remember the change from standard definition to high definition right i still remember the change but I mean, it's cool. It's interesting to have a complete cast change all of a sudden. Uh, I thought that was a, a, it'll do better in the in the short term because it has like yeah, Sean Ashmore and a couple people here and there. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I'm not sure about the long term appeal of the game in terms of the story aspect. But uh, right now, I'm I'm not feeling the game just yet. Uh, mostly just because I want to see like a 20 minute gameplay demo, like not. Not just what they showed off at E3 this year, or not E3, Gamescom. Not what they showed off at Gamescom, because Gamescom made the game look a little too easy. Like right. I know they were like showcasing, hey, look at all the powers and all the cool stuff we can do. But I really wanted to see, like, okay, how hard is this game gonna be? Is it gonna right. be a? Is it gonna be a cakewalk? Is it gonna be like a challenging tactical thing? Right. Uh, sh show me what the deal is, and that, that's what I'm looking forward to. I always look more for gameplay more than graphics. If the if the gameplay stinks, what's the point? Right. Right. Brandon, your thoughts? Yeah, man. Y'all know me, man. I ain't counting no peas out here. But, uh, <laughs> you know, and. and in regards to the game, and I, uh, I'm definitely impressed with what uh, Remedy has done um, as, as far as the way the game looks overall. Um, I think they really captured uh, the essence of, of what they're trying to bring to gamers. Um, so I applaud them on that. Um, but like Anchor, I, I'm definitely still on the fence about the game. Um, I want to see how the dynamic of actual gameplay affects the TV show. Right. Um, because they said, you know, certain choices that you make in the game kind of affects the outcome of the TV show um, because there's different versions depending on what you do within the game. Uh, so I really want to see them show off that aspect of the game um, so we can see it, you know, running in real time. Um, but, you know, it's definitely on my radar, definitely something I'll, I'll, I'll probably pick up uh, when it releases. But, um, you know, I, I, I got to see what the, what the game is going to be about because I'm kind of on a cliffhanger right now. Gotcha. Well, you know, my in my opinion, from everything that I've seen, you know, I've I've been an advocate for Quantum Break. I've been showing gifts on this thing, and uh, and I mean, they have looked very, very impressive every time I see them. 
Um, one of them that I really love is when, and, and I know some of you guys, some of the fans out there that are listening, if you've seen this, it, it's the sequence where the character bursts forward and he's moving so fast that when he stops, his body is off balance. Like he literally only has one hand on the gun and he's leaning and then he regains his balance and grabs the gun, aims and fires. It's an amazing attention to detail that they've done in the game. I'm highly impressed in my opinion. And again, this is my opinion because I may piss some people off when I say this. I think the game looks better than Uncharted. I'm sorry. I just have to say it. <clears throat> if I'm going to compare two linear games, in my opinion, it looks better than Uncharted. It looks more realistic. The, the action and the explosions in the game look more realistic. I love the shadows in the game. I don't know what it is. I'm just really blown away by the game. I really think it looks that good. And if it plays that good, this game will probably be another mega franchise for the Xbox One. Be honest with you, with with Crackdown, if Crackdown plays the way it does, that could be another mega franchise. And I, you know what? I've got to I got to get in contact with um, Andrea Renee because she. Shut me down last time when I said Crackdown could possibly be Microsoft's next mega franchise because of the cloud. And she said, nah, it couldn't be because of the old ones. I'm telling you, look at the fans. Look at DX12 and look at how everybody's talking about cloud and what they can do with it based on Crackdown. Don't think Crackdown can't be that next mega franchise for Xbox One. It can, and so can Quantum Breaks. So I'm looking forward to both, um, and I, I, I can't wait to get my hands on them. So that's it for the show, guys. We really appreciate you checking us out. I want to thank Anchorman for uh, coming in and things like that. We will hear more of him on Tick Podcast. Um, he's already a part of the TICGN team in the Tick Network, um, so I'm really grateful for that. Um, glad that B-Money is back, um, and hopefully... Not next week, but the week after, we'll get back on a regular schedule and we'll be putting up content and putting up shows as we get our schedules and things in order and stuff like that um, on our next episode. If you're listening to us on Apple, Android, um, if you're listening to us on uh, Podbean or Stitcher, please, please give us a vote. Um, You know, it doesn't matter whether it's you know, three stars, four stars, five stars, that's fine. But give us a rating. That actually helps us get up in the uh, more recognizable section, I guess you could say, of different podcasts. If you really love Tick Podcast, support us and give us a rating and things like that. Please leave comments in the YouTube section. We really appreciate that. And please check out TICGN.com and TICGN.com backslash beta. It's our new social hub. We are going to start building. We want you guys to get on, have, you know, conversations with people, leave ideas in the forum section, and hopefully we can build the ultimate destination for Xbox gamers and the gaming community to be social and meet new gamers. I want to thank you guys for listening. We'll be back, um, like I said again, in the following week. And Anchorman and myself will We'll finally get back to doing a multiverse podcast. So stay tuned for that. We'll be doing that live on the TICGN channel if you're interested in checking it out. If not, you can always catch a recording of it um, once it's complete. So we'll catch you guys later. I'm your host, KLRS Kalel, and we are off this planet. Peace.